I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Falling in love with him. That is the theme that we are using on these Sunday night connection group study times. It's one of those byproducts of getting to know Him. The more you come to know Jesus, the more you just have to fall in love with Him. And this Gospel of John helps us to do both. It really helps us to come to know Jesus uh, more closely. And as we do, we just have to fall in love with Him. And stories like what we began in John chapter 8 with that woman caught in the very act of adultery is one of those stories, much like what we saw in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman at the well that causes you to fall in love with Jesus because of His compassion, because of His love for those that are deemed as uh, the unworthy or the outcast. And so if you have your Bibles, I hope you will open them back up to John chapter 8, and we'll just kind of take up where we left off last Lord's Day. After He had dealt with the woman that was uh, brought to him as he said go ahead and stone her but let the one who has no sin be the first to cast the stone and as her accusers disappeared one by one leaving him alone with the woman and his challenge to her not to condemn her but at the same time not to condone her but to challenge her to go and sin no more and now you pick up with verse 12 of John chapter 8, when Jesus spoke again now to the people, he said, I am the light of the world, and everyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but instead will have the very light of life. And the Pharisees now challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. But Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one, but if I do judge, my decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself, and my other witness is the Father who sent me. And then... They asked him, Where is your father? And Jesus responds, You don't know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the temple. In the courts of the temple near the palace where the offerings were put. And yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus is teaching in these temple courts. That's what he was doing when the woman caught in adultery was brought 
to him. And he just continues on in his teaching. In verse 21, Once more Jesus said to them, I'm going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. And where I go, you cannot come. Now this made the Jews ask, Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But in verse 23, Jesus continues, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. Much like what he would be saying to Pilate later on, My kingdom is not of this world. But here he says, I am not of this world. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am He, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked, as if he had not told them on a number of occasions already. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. Now they did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many of them put their faith in him. And so as Jesus is in this temple courtyard, and as he is continuing to teach and continuing to be challenged by the leaders and deal with those challenges, many of those that are listening and maybe even eavesdropping from afar are recognizing that there is something about this Jesus, like those officers that were sent to arrest him. No man ever spake like this man, much like what is found at the end of Matthew chapter 7. He left the crowd in awe because he spoke as one who had authority not like one of their scribes or one of their rabbis. And so now verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus now said this to them, If you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples, and you will come to know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Now their response to that declaration is so interesting. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? We've made this observation before, but it bears repeating. When they say we have never been slaves to anyone, it is easy, I guess, for them to forget those 400 plus years in Egypt. It's easy, I guess, for them to forget the Assyrian captivity under the leadership of Sennacherib. It's easy for them to forget, I suppose, the Babylonian captivity under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. It's evidently pretty easy for them to forget their current situation in bondage to Rome under a multitude of Caesars. But they still speak from their ignorance. We are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been slaves of anyone. So how can you now say that we will be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And now a slave has no place no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, 
you will be free indeed. Now I know that you are Abraham's descendants, and yet you're looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. That's just an interesting phrasing there. You have no room for my word. A challenge to each one of us to be sure that we always make room for this word that will set us free. So you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And you're doing what you've heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you're occupied looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Now look closely at verse 42 because fireworks are truly about to begin. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, then you would love me. For I came from God and now am here. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the very beginning. He, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he's merely speaking his native language. For he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. And yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Listen to this profound challenge in verse 46. Can any one of you prove me guilty of sin? Now, they had been making all kinds of accusations towards him, and they would continue to make all kinds of accusations towards him. But this is a very pertinent question that he's posing. Can any one of you prove me guilty of sin. If I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Now, folks, it's important to keep in mind the context of this entire event. These are the religious leaders of the day. These are those who took a lot of pride in claiming to be Abraham's children. And yet Jesus is directing this statement to them. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says, and the reason you're not hearing is because you don't belong to God. And so now verse 48, the Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Wrong on both counts. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Well now, at this, they exclaim, Now we know 
that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And you say, whoever obeys your word will never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Just who do you think you are? You know, the logic they're using is, is very sound logic from a worldly standpoint. You're claiming that anyone who hears your word and believes your word and obeys your word will never die. Once again, they are thinking physically. They're thinking of this world. Jesus has already challenged them with that. You're from below. You're from this world. I'm not from this world. I'm talking to you about things that are spiritual. I'm talking to you about things that are eternal. And so they just, through all of this, are, are concluding, well, Abraham died, the prophets died. You're surely not saying you're greater than these. Just who do you think you are? And Jesus replied in verse 54, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me, though you don't know him. I do know him. If I said I did not, then I would be a liar just like you. Keep in mind the context. Keep in mind to whom he is speaking. A tremendous charge is being brought at the feet of these religious leaders. You are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. When he lies, he's speaking na his native language. You're just like your father. If I said I did not know God, I would be a liar just like you. But he goes on, but I do know him, and I obey his word. And if it, wasn't, uh, if it wasn't a little dicey already, if the waters weren't a little rough already, they're about to get even worse. In verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and he was glad. Verse 57, You're not even yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, Are you in verse 58 of John chapter 8? Before Abraham was born, I am. Now folks, those two words, I am, harken back to that burning bush episode, doesn't it? After Moses had been challenged by God to go to Egypt to secure the release of God's people who had never been in bondage, according to them. But when Moses was being convinced he needed to go, he said, Who, who am I going to say has sent me? You remember what God gave to him as an answer to that question. You tell them, I am has sent you. And so all throughout this amazing Gospel of John, we find Jesus using those two words. I am the light of this world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the gate. Over and over. And now here, in response to them asking him about how can you say that Abraham saw your day and was glad in it, 
Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. Now you know that they recognize the significance of what Jesus was saying. You see, the significance of what Jesus was saying is He is God. He is eternal. He was there with God in the beginning, which makes sense when you go back to that creation account. Let us make man in our image. It is also in keeping with how this amazing gospel started. If you will remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the very light of, of all the people. And that light shines in the darkness, and that darkness has not overcome it. And then that amazing verse 14 of John chapter 1, And the Word became flesh, and it made its dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only uh, begotten Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So they understood the significance of this amazing claim that Jesus is making before Abraham was born, I am. You know they understood the significance because of their response in verse 59. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. We're going to continue on next Lord's Day, Lord willing, with John chapter 9. And these events will just keep recurring over and over and over again as Jesus displays through His works and through His words that He is the very Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Anointed One. All who obey His words, He says, will never taste of death. But you'll be set free when you come to know this truth. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Continue to study. Continue to come to know Him. And as you come to know Him, just keep falling in love with Him over and over Again, God bless you.